I want to tell you about a very lowly form of life, a slime mold. It is the present-day counterpart of the primordial ooze that appeared on Earth many, many eons ago. The descendant of this primordial ooze, the substance which gives life to all plants and animals, we call it protoplasm. Now let us go into the woods and collect the protoplasm of a slime mold. We shall probably find it growing on an old stump, such as this one. Or if the first stump reveals nothing, we'll search for another. And now here's better luck. Golden yellow protoplasm glistening in the sun. No shape to it, for it's always changing shape. No cells, no tissue, just protoplasm. One protoplasmic mass with many living nuclei. Having collected the protoplasm in nature, we can now grow it in the laboratory. Here is a culture of the slime mold Fissarum, growing so luxuriantly that it is crawled out of its culture dish. Note here this hanging thread of protoplasm on the left, with a mass of protoplasm on the end of it. It reveals the tensile strength of the living substance and all the while the protoplasm is flowing up and down in this living thread. Here we have a closer view of the culture. In the center is an island on which the food is placed. Slime molds are very fond of oatmeal. And surrounding the island is a moat of water. And here a still nearer view of a small part of the whole such as we would see if we used a hand lens. Remember, this is not tissue, not an aggregation of cells, but just protoplasm. And through it all, there is constant streaming. And now the protoplasm is seen through the microscope. The movement never ceases as long as there is life, except during hibernation in wintertime. Here is a younger portion of the plasmodium. Could we but understand the cause of this constant movement, we should be nearer to an understanding of what life is. The protoplasm here flows all over the surface. Later, definite channels will be established. The granules which you see are nuclei, fat droplets, vacuoles, and bits of food. Here the plasmodium assumes its mature form, but even now the arteries are transitory, and soon the whole picture will change. Note particularly the reversal in direction of flow, with a rhythmic period of 50 seconds. We shall now indulge in some work in microdissection. Here are several types of micromanipulators in which glass needles are clamped and controlled. Our problem is to prove that protoplasm is elastic. We prove it by tearing protoplasm with needles, just as a surgeon dissects the human body. And for this operation, we must have a pair of delicate needles made either in a tiny flame, such as this, or better yet, with the aid of a hot platinum wire. And now let us compare this microdissection needle with a good new sewing needle. We have all sorts of instruments for microdissection. Here is a double needle holder used as forceps. But we must get to work and tear the protoplasm to see if it holds together, or if it is simply a fluid like water. And for this purpose, we need a culture on a microscope slide, which becomes the roof of a small moist chamber with open ends, with the protoplasm on the inside. Here we are putting the needle into one of the open ends, and you will see the protoplasm on the underside of the roof of the moist chamber. 
We move the protoplasm aside for a moment in order to find the needle. And here it is. Now we are ready to dissect. And to prove how tough and elastic protoplasm is. We can not only dissect, but we inject with this delicate hypodermic needle, which is here merely blowing a bubble. Let us inject a toxic salt, and you will see the protoplasm suddenly stop. Beyond, out of the picture, the protoplasm flows on as before. Thus the protoplasm meets contingencies, heals itself, and thus saves itself. We turn now to a typical medical problem, anesthesia. When the normal protoplasm is treated with carbon dioxide, it slowly goes to sleep. Here is another specimen. Now it too is slowly going to sleep. And now a few minutes later we get the first indications of recovery. And a quarter of an hour later, almost the same culture back again. Healthy, normal protoplasm. And an hour later, we can't tell any difference between this protoplasm and that before anesthesia. Another specimen. It doesn't matter what I use to anesthetize protoplasm. Ether, chloroform, cold, or I can even hit it on the head with little droplets of water. There you just saw the normal reversal in this culture. But in this case, it is carbon dioxide. But now the gas is on. Watch it. So sudden a cessation of flow could occur only if the protoplasm has solidified. Here is still another patient under high magnification. We made a discovery that the rhythmic forces in protoplasm are even more basic than the flow. For when the protoplasm recovers, it doesn't just start flowing, it resumes as though it had been flowing all the while. In a moment now, the protoplasm slowly quiets down. Note that there is a slight nervous shock just before anesthesia takes place. Let me illustrate what I just said, that when the protoplasm recovers, it will be on the same curve. The rhythm has continued underneath, so to speak, even though the protoplasm has been asleep there is still something going on. We must be very close indeed to the question, what is life? The theory applies no matter what anesthetic agent is used. With the dentist's laughing gas, nitrous oxide, we also get a quick stop. And in time, full recovery. Anesthesia by electric shock is known, but never used on man. It is too dangerous. The electrical setup is a little complicated, for we must know voltage and amperage. The electrodes are of platinum wire, which are now being put into position. 30 volts are first administered, but the shock is insufficient. You see the electrodes coming into place. Now the upper one, and now the shock. Sixty volts produce complete anesthesia with little injury. You will note that there's no streaming anywhere now on the picture. But there's no permanent damage. You get full recovery a few moments later. Let us see what a higher voltage will do. This isn't anesthesia, it's electrocution.
I have done much work on toxicity, observing the effects of poisons. Here's what sulfur dioxide does to protoplasm. If anesthetic agents gelatinize protoplasm, stimulants should have the opposite effect, and so it proved. They liquefy protoplasm. The protoplasm here is literally pouring out into the surrounding medium, going into solution. All continuity in structure is lost, and of course that means death. Theobromin is a close relative of caffeine, a stimulant, and it too disintegrates protoplasm. As before, the slime mold is going into solution in the surrounding water. So you have two pictures. On the one hand, anesthesia and solidification. On the other hand, stimulation and liquefaction. As this curve depicts, normal protoplasm lies between the liquid and solid states. The solidification in anesthesia is not coagulation, for that would mean death. You cannot unclot blood, or as the chemists say, you can't unboil an egg. Anesthetized protoplasm gelatinizes and becomes quite firm. If the gelation goes too far, death by coagulation results. At the one end of the curve, we have liquefaction, and at the other end of the curve, solidification, which in both cases can result in death. In order to test the theory, I tried heroin, and this was a surprise. I'd always thought morphine and heroin to be depressants, and so I expected the protoplasm to gelate, to become firm. And when we saw this, we thought our theory would fall. Until we got hold of Goodman and Gilman and read some five pages telling us that the opium derivatives are stimulants, not depressants. So the reaction which you see here upheld my theory after all. An extraordinarily interesting problem is the fusion of two droplets of protoplasm. Now, egg and sperm readily fuse, whereas two amoebae can crawl all over each other, but they never fuse. Two drops of slime mold protoplasm frequently go together, but when and why they do, and when and why they don't, is a problem. Sometimes they go for each other in a big way, as you see here. And sometimes there is merely a caress. They touch each other and retreat. But after all, a caress may lead to complete union. And then the protoplasm fuses with absolute compatibility. It's important that the direction of flow in the two cases should be synchronized. One or the other must give way until we have a wholly harmonious flowing together. Frequently, two plasmodia will gaze at each other literally for hours on end, as those two did, and then finally cross at one point. Once they decide that they like each other, then the fusion is complete. Notice between these two, you have a strip of no man's land where fusion never occurs. It took quite a lot of thinking to understand why that should be true. But I believe there's a toxic substance secreted that fills in that space and they simply won't cross each other's toxic area.
We come now to one of the greatest problems in biology. What makes protoplasm flow? To say it is life is no answer. The biologist wants to know the physics and chemistry of protoplasmic streaming. I had an idea. Perhaps the outer layer of protoplasm pulsates and pumps the inner substance just as does the human heart. Here is my proof. What you see is the same protoplasm, but now speeded up by time-lapse photography. The rhythmic period of the pulsation is, as one would expect, the same as that of the rhythmic flow. Here's a primitive heart, one drop of protoplasm pulsating out, in, out, in. If a theory is a really good one, it should fit all cases. I therefore studied chaos, a giant amoeba with many nuclei, and hunted for rhythmic pulsations. I speeded up the photography, but still no evidence of a rhythm. Rhythmic movement, but not rhythmic pulsation. At least we couldn't find it. The theory is an excellent one, but it isn't true. Mind you, the rhythm is there. Rhythmical motion is a fundamental property of living matter, but it is not the cause of the protoplasmic streaming. Both are the result of a rhythmic force which we have not yet discovered. Then along came Camille, and he said to me, let's measure the horsepower of this living machine. I'll do it by applying pressure or suction, just as one breaks an engine. He built a double-chambered box and put on each side of the central wall droplets of protoplasm connected by a fine living thread. When the flow of protoplasm was in one direction, Camille applied pressure and held it quiet. When the flow was in the opposite direction, suction was applied to stop it. The pressure applied is a measure of the vital force. Here he's holding the protoplasm quiet. And then he records the force necessary to do this. And here he lets it go. And here we have the normal reversal, showing that there's been no injury caused by the experiment. Now he holds it quiet again, and each time records the pressure or the suction necessary to hold it quiet. From these measurements, Camille drew curves which depict the rhythmic flow of protoplasm. These curves, such as this one, Dr. Camille analyzed as a physicist would a curve in harmonics. I felt that biology had at last become an exact science. Note in this curve the little irregularities at the top to the right. Note that they always recur. This led to a remarkable discovery, that there is not one rhythm in protoplasm, but many rhythms. Protoplasm is a polyrhythmic system. Later in Japan, Dr. Kamiya measured the electrical force or potential of flowing protoplasm and found the same rhythm there as he had found when he measured pressure. In short, mechanical pressure and electrical pressure parallel each other. The meaning of this is far-reaching, but just what it is we have not yet found out though I have an idea and I shall tell you about it in a moment. About this time when biologists and chemists were thinking in terms of polymer chemistry, of macromolecules and long molecular fibers, my friends in Europe said, the power driving this living machine is within the stream, not at the surface. It is the flowing molecules themselves, the long accordion-pleated polypeptide chains which move the stream or rather they are the stream. These folded molecules open and close and move forward like a caterpillar. If you can imagine seeing at a distance an army of caterpillars coming down the Champs-Élysées, the procession would appear to flow. This is another beautiful theory, but I don't believe it. You can't open and close these molecules so easily.
I want to show you now the nervous activity which muscle fibers display, first shown to me by my colleague, Dr. Cookson. Notice the rhythmic procession of waves, which represent impulses radiating from nervous centers. These I like to call excitation foci. Remember, too, that in a plasmodium, there is not one rhythm, but many rhythms, such as you see here. I concluded that all forms of motion in protoplasm are the result of nervous impulses emanating from excitation foci. These rhythmic waves in muscle fibers are basically the same as those you saw in the protoplasm of a primitive slime mold. Synchronized with these visible waves are electrical impulses, which can be measured and recorded. Electrical impulses, therefore, are responsible for protoplasmic movement, for the contraction of muscle, and the transmission of messages along nerve fibers. This is my theory, and this is as near as we have gotten to a physical interpretation of life forces. I've always been interested in the twists and spirals in living things. And so I thought, protoplasm must have a twist in it. And I went in search of it, even though some of my friends said, Pooh, another one of Seifert's mystical rhythms. You know, Darcy Thompson, who was a great student of form and growth, studied spirals in animate nature with great care. I, like every biologist, have long wanted to meet Darcy Thompson, but the opportunity did not come until late in life. And of all places, on the dance floor at the City Hall in Aberdeen, Scotland. Darcy Thompson, a fine old man, then 80 years of age, was there dancing with a lovely young lady whom I should judge to be about 18 years of age. But the hour was late, past my bedtime, and I <coughs> took the matter in hand and went on to the dance floor and simply interrupted. Darcy Thompson glared at me and said, you can't have her. And I'm afraid I was rude, but I said, I don't want her. Then he said, what do you want? And I said, I just want to meet Darcy Thompson. Well, he said, all right, who are you? Oh, I said, that doesn't matter. You never heard of me. He said, who are you? I said, I'm Seifert. Oh, yes, he said, you're the fellow that thinks everything grows in spirals. And I said, well, you're an authority on growth, doesn't it? He said, of course it does, but you thought you discovered something. And now this is how we prove that protoplasm goes in spirals. We attached a tiny mirror to the end of a thread of living protoplasm and reflected a beam of light onto a circular scale. Dr. Kinnear did the experimental work with his usual brilliant ingenuity. One day, he called me into his darkened room, and all that I saw there was this spot of light traveling back and forth on the circular scale. But I knew what it meant. Protoplasm has a twist in it. As the protoplasm flows up and down the living thread, the mirror on the end of the thread slowly turns and reflects the spot of light. And so we show that all life has a twist in it. I think you'll agree that protoplasm is a very remarkable substance. Often I talk about it as if it had intelligence and my colleagues raise their eyebrows. I don't say it is intelligent, but it does often do the intelligent thing. And after all, we are made of protoplasm.